Hey everybody. Well, I'll just start from the top, shall I? Um, sorry about that. I this week I'm just gonna keep finishing off the. <laughs> that's right, short lived. Maybe uh, maybe next week I'll do a full full mine with the white white paint. What's what's that famous um what's that famous mime's name? Can't remember. Might be a bit too old for uh, for a lot of people. Um. So, yeah, I'm going to finish off this week the, the spaceship. Like I was saying at the start, which nobody heard, I'm pretty sick of working on it. I think we're up to the fifth week of working on it now. So it's kind of uh, it's time to finish this, this off and move on to something else. I'm sure everybody's sick of working on Flip as well. So um, I'm going to just go through the renders that I did. So what I was... What I was showing, Marcel Marceau. That's it. Yeah, I think I think you're right. Um, ah, and now, so the problem I was having before when uh, my audio wasn't working was that I had a render process going, and so it was just killing my nuke. Um, so I rendered these passes during the week and overnight as well. I combined a couple of them. It's the uh, flip. The flip points and the flip streams, I think I combined into one pass. This one here. So we've got water, we've got ship, and we've got our flip simulation, our main flip simulation. We've got our mist, which has a few errors. Um, and we've got our, yeah, our flip points and our pop streams combined into one pass. The flip sim also has some weird errors that I don't know what's causing it. I have... I have like a vague idea of maybe what to try to try and fix it, but um, there's some weird popping and movement going on in the flip sim, so I don't really know what's going on there. Um, let me kill this. Let's have a look. So there's all the passes. And uh, as I was saying when you couldn't hear me, a cool way to look at all the different passes in Nuke is to put a contact sheet down. And this can be really good for um, for showreels and breakdowns. Like if you wanted to show all the passes at once, you can plug them all into a contact sheet. So what I do, there's a, there's a kind of handy shortcut for Nuke. So it's a, you know, just tab contact sheet node. Um, what is handy in Nuke is if you select, let me just unplug all of these if I can. If you select the node that you want to connect things to, and then hold shift and select the other node that you want to that you want to actually connect to that contact sheet and then hit y it will connect it up for you if i want to connect all of these i can do this and it's um it's connecting it up left to right i think so i'll select them actually select that one first hold shift then select all of those and hit y and it will connect all of those things oh it looks like it does it uh does it right to left yeah oh, that's weird um but anyway, there you go. So you can see you can get all of those things connected up to the contact sheet automatically. So select the contact sheet first, hold shift, select everything else, and hit Y, and it connects them all up. Uh, and depending on the order that they plug in, that's the order that they'll kind of be. You can also, on the contact sheet, have the ability to kind of change the orientation, or like, you know, you could have it sort of orient differently. So two rows vertically instead of two rows horizontally. Oh, that's interesting. Um, and then you have resolution, so you can change the resolution if you want. That one's actually better. Um, so yeah, it's a really good way of just looking at all your passes all at once. I don't know why I'm getting an error here. I might just need to reload my water. There we go. So, let's composite these together quickly, and we'll have a look at what we've got. So I've got my ship here, and the ship's just going to go straight over the top of the water. Like so. There we go. Beautiful. Then our flip points, probably the next thing that's going to go on there. So I'm going to put a merge down, M, A over B. Oh, looks like we've got some resolution issues, maybe. I think I rendered this as 1920 by 1080, but I might have done it half res. Or perhaps I did it at 1280 by 720. So I'm going to reformat this one. Reformat node, just choose the, 
the res that you're looking for. So HD 1920 by 1080, then that should sit properly. There we go. So you can see the error here. There's some weird kind of popping and then there's some weird jumping in the sim, which I'm not going to be able to fix without re-simulating, but that popping is something that's quite obviously bad. You know, it really stands out as being an error. So I will have to try and fix that. But um, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll try and do some post fix before I go back and look at the simulation. I think I've seen this before and it's a problem where I have two different collision um, sources where I have the ship and the water as different collision volumes. But if I combine them together into the single collision, so like turn them both into VDBs, VDB merge them back together so they're one VDB, I think that might fix it. I don't know. I might be wrong about that, but uh, that's what I would try. So merge the streams on as well. So we can see they're just the flip streams and the pop streams. I made the pop streams quite a bit thinner as well. So they don't really stand out super strong. They're really just fine details. And then I've got this mist and the mist I have sort of had another crack at simulating. So it's less noisy on the top, but it, if you have a look at it, it's quite, it's quite bubbly, which, you know, probably just could be a higher resolution sim, but it's also quite active. Like it's very, it feels like it's really pumping out. So that would be something that I would want to fix and that would require a resim. It just feels a bit, a bit uh, kind of, yeah, too active. Um, Abby, is that pure simulation or just effect? I don't really know what, what do you mean by just effect? Th this, so, I mean, if you haven't seen the other videos, I'm not simulating the ocean as flip. The ocean is just a geometry and I'm creating all of the sort of water effects as an additional pass. So we have this main flip sim, which is doing the kind of foam. Um, and then, you know, everything is kind of just on the ship, basically. Um, did I add noise in the mist, Michael? Yes, there's a little bit, but I turned it right down because um, I don't know if you saw the last one, but the last mist that I had was very, let's see, this one? No, um, was very noisy and it just, it looked very wrong. Um, let's see, where is it? I guess it's not in here. Test render. No, I don't know. I don't know where I saved that one. But yeah, it was super noisy and it just looked wrong. So I, I turned the noise right down. It's very smooth, which could do with a little bit more noise. But uh, yeah, I think I think the problem, you know, is, is the source really. is a big part of it is the source is a bit too blobby. You know, it could be finer as, uh, you know, as we've seen in the past that a finer detailed source will result in a finer detailed sim. This doesn't need to be super broken up. It's going to be, you know, this is too, too strong at the moment. So I'm going to want to knock this back anyway. Um, but just the way that it looks coming off the ship is just too fast. One idea I thought that I could do is actually to mask out the mist over the ship a little bit. If I take, whoops, if I copy the ship and paste that down here, that ship pass, and then multiply the mist by the ship. So mask into the multiply and the ship in there and then bring that down. You can see I can actually get rid of the stuff that's on the ship and then that, it's still gonna probably look a bit too active, but at least I won't get that stuff sort of streaming across the ship's surface, which kind of looks the worst. So the other thing you could do is potentially just knock it back in that area not completely but you know right down to point 0.1 so so that when we come up here it's much less noticeable on the top of the ship but we sort of see it streaming underneath and that actually seems to work a little better it's probably still a little bit too active but yeah you can see that that's kind of stopped that ugly 
stuff happening on the ship and we could we could restore you know more of it if we wanted to just by playing with this multiply value yeah maybe something like that coffee time um all right so yeah we got those flip streams by themselves they don't look super good so that pass could certainly you know be improved but when we add the flip points that's all sort of not super noticeable you can definitely see that yeah you know, that popping that flashing what i'm hoping is that water though those points are still there they're just sort of moving up and down a little bit below the um, water surface and that i might be able to restore them to the water surface by using a ray or something like that um that might help with the flickering i don't know i'm gonna try it um so there we go i think that's kind of all my passes that i have obviously yeah i've got two passes combined into one with the flip streams and pop streams i think overall you know this this could benefit from m more work um and i might do that at some point but um i think the main thing that it could probably benefit from is a sense of like bubbles before the ship rises and maybe some sense that there is a volume under here because our water is not transparent so we can't see that so you know just some sense that there's something below i think bubbles hitting the surface before the ship actually rises would be cool um and maybe even a little bit of displacement of the water that pushes the water up a little bit might be interesting to try um but overall, you know, I'm mostly happy. I think the flip, this one, uh, flip streams is probably a bit too low resolution, but you can see the flip sim itself now has quite a bit of nice detail. Still, when I see individual points like this, it feels a little bit unrealistic. So potentially, you know, going higher res on that um, would be, you know, would be a good idea. But there's some really nice details in there. This weird stuff that happens as well, um, sorry for the flickering, it's just what Nuke does when it's re kind of calculating parts that have already been, the parts that have already been solved or cached to memory don't flicker and then as it's adding the rest, it sort of fills in. Um, so there's these areas sometimes that you get where you get these random splashes that kind of shoot up and they're not super bad. Um, there's one there, so, see this one, this here, this little spray that shoots up. Now, there's nothing in the velocities that, uh, that should be generating things like that. What that is caused by is the same thing that I think is the problem with the flickering of the water, or the foam, is the point where the ship and the um vol like the volume of the ship and the volume of the water where they kind of intersect for some reason when you have them as separate geometries it creates these weird velocities in the simulation so i've seen this before and the way i fixed it was to join those together so i'm hoping that that solves a few problems um there you go you can see the mist underneath is looking quite cool but yeah, you can see it back here. It's kind of just feels like it's streaming off a bit too quickly. So slowing that down, slowing that velocity maybe, or just even the time scale of that um, of that simulation might might kind of help. I don't know. I have to try it. Uh, all right. So let's. <laughs> hey, kill. Yeah, my favorite too. My only my only software that I use now is Houdini and well and Nuke. Um, I, oh, you're talking about Nuke, I assume. Sorry. Well, Nuke is 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 one of my favorite softwares, but uh, but Houdini is probably my favorite. Um, all right, so let's let's dive back into Houdini. Sorry if it's not your favorite. Um, and I'm gonna have a look at this flip issue. So here's the scene. For anyone that hasn't seen this uh, seen this before, this is the water mesh that I have and this is just this is actually just showing um render time displacement in the viewport here's my ship model and this is my flip particles where the issue is occurring and I'm gonna go into here and just have a look at this hide other and what we can see we should be able to see that 
issue occur. It's really hard to scrub because it's a lot of points. Let's see if we can find a frame where that might be happening. Like here, between 204 and 205, a lot of this water kind of dips down below. Even 203, 204, and 205, it sort of comes and goes quite a bit there. 202, 203, 204, let's go there. Um, and see if we can see. It's going to be hard because, you know, we're just kind of looking at points like this, but see if we can see something happening here. So 202, 203, 204. I can't really see too much popping and jumping there, but perhaps, perhaps it's just like a misalignment of the wave displacement and the the actual displacement of the um, of the mesh that I'm using as a collider. So let's try and let's try and fix it. We've got all this stuff falling below as well, which is interesting. I mean, one thing that we could potentially do. Let's go to uh, let's find out which frame it's below again. Two or two. Let's go two or five. And render this. So I'll go and do test render surfacing test I'm going to just turn on the water the flip so anything that's visible is going to render in this surfacing test mantra and let's make sure it's pretty low samples because samples two and two that should be all right turn off motion blur it's rendering half res so that's good render view surfacing test let's render the first thing I'm going to check, I'll, I'll just do a render first of all to see what we've got. But then I'm going to try maybe giving a little bit of transparency to the water and see if it shows up some of those points that might be below the water. So that might be the easiest way to fix it, although it may create an incredibly slow render. So there we go. I think in this area here is where we can kind of see... See this section here, that's kind of what I was looking at. So on 205, 204 there's this, and then 205 it kind of disappears below. So let's see, in this area, if I was to make the water, let's go to the water material. If I was to add a little bit of transparency to the water, let's just do point 0.1. And see if anything shows up. Take a snapshot. Point five. No, it's kind of hard to see under there. Let me go to uh, opacity and turn on fake caustics. Aha! There we go. So fake caustics stops the shadows from the refraction. And we can see that that stuff is actually just under the water. So it's not actually disappearing, it's just going below that water surface. And that's why it causes it to uh, to look like it's flashing. So this, this would help, although it really changes the look of my water and it's going to be a bit more expensive to render. Um, so what I want to try is, turning that back to zero. So you can see there's all this stuff under here that should be there. So what I'm going to try is to, let's see, what could I do? What could I do? Oh, it's going to be tricky, but let's, let's merge the water. So mm -hmm. out water surface, maybe this, maybe it's this one here that we should use out water surface. Let's have a look at that. Turn our material context off. There we go. What is my PC specs? Um, good question. I have Core i7s overclocked to, you can see they've clocked about one gigahertz more than what they say. So they're running at about 4.6, over 128 gig of RAM, 
and my GPU is a GeForce RTX 2070 Super, which is okay. And really, a lot of the stuff that I'm doing here is not us utilizing the GPU at all. Uh, it's all really just memory and CPU at this stage. A little bit of GPU, but, but really not. Um, all right, so here's my surface. And this is what's being used as the collision object. So this is probably the problem, is that the um, this is lower resolution than what I'm actually getting in my render. And potentially, you know, there's some height differences. So there's a little bit of a discrepancy between the displacement that's happening at render time and the displacement I'm using for my collision. Which, if you remember all the way back to the start, is why I started doing it just on a flat plane and then looked at displacing it as post option. That probably would work better in this case, but I found it was not giving me great results with my sim. So there's trade-offs with every kind of choice. Um, so what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I'm going to take the water surface maybe from here, this one, this VDB that I created. Let's create that. We'll grab that, this VDB. And it's called out water VDB. So I'm just going to maybe, oh, here's my simulation down here somewhere. Where are you? Top import. So here's my simulation. Here's my out point. And <laughs> how many lights? So many lights. Well, I've turned a lot of them off actually, but the, the RAM lights, I can't turn off. Um, unfortunately. Although my, my three-year-old son really, uh, really likes looking at the lights and, uh, the fact that I can control the lights so he can just say, make your computer purple and I can, well, that's a bit of fun, but, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not so much into the, <laughs> into the lights. Um, although I do have these lights, look at these, I usually, I used to have these set up in the background of my streams, but I haven't had them in for a while because they needed charging, but. Just stick them in the side of my computer. Um, so, what was I doing? Ah, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to use a. I'm going to do some vex. Hmm, let's see if I can do this. I'm going to grab that VDB of the water, and I'm going to try and sample everything that's below the water surface. Let's see if I can do that with this. I may, I may need to think about it slightly differently. I don't know. Um, let's use a volume sample. So I'm going to create an attribute called, uh, I don't know, inside, let's say. Volume sample. And a volume sample uh, requires geometry, so we're going to use the second input. So I'll put one for the second input, so zero, one, two, three. And then you can see that it requires a volume name or a primitive number and a vector position. So the vector position is P. The volume name is going to be whatever the volume is over here, which is surface, should be. Bring that over there. There's the volume name surface. So I'm going to put one. Oops. One for the second input. I'm going to bring in the name surface. And then as a position reference, I'm going to use P. And that should give me a value when something is inside that volume. So you know that volume is the kind of surface of the water and a bit below. So let's do uh, at CD equals at inside and see what we get. Okay, we got something. We got black inside, which is interesting. I was kind of expecting the opposite, but yeah, whatever. Let's put a color node down so we can do this a little bit more intuitively. Let's put ramp from attribute inside. And I'll set it to uh, infrared. And you know, by this display, it tells me that my values are definitely not approaching one. They're sort of in this range because all I'm seeing is purple and blue. So they're kind of between z like zero and 0 0.25 or even less. So if I change this to 0 0.25, I should see 
you know, and the more I reduce it until I get to red, it's sort of an indication of what that range is. Now, there's an easier way of kind of figuring that out rather than doing that, but visually that's a nice way to do it. Geometry spreadsheet, have a look at that inside attribute and you can see that we have between negative 0.75 and positive 0.75. So let's make this negative 0.075 and we'll go back to our scene view and 0.075. Cool. So the good thing with a SDF, which is what this surface field is, is that it gives you both negative and positive values. So negative when it's inside, I guess that makes sense. Negative when it's inside, it's giving us the purple. And then it, it's going to go blue and green and sort of right around, because this is in the midpoint <coughs> of these two values now, this is kind of going to be the surface, the actual level of the surface. So you can see that green there. And then anything above that is going to be outside. So anything from this point up to red is outside. And you can see this stuff is really outside. It's, it's all red. So what I'm thinking here is that I can use this ramp to sort of uh, maybe mix a different position on. So perhaps I could do something like this where I put a ray down and I ray the points over here. I'm going to ray collision primitives. I'm going to take the water geometry and I'm just going to do a minimum distance and snap everything to the top. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, or, actually, it just occurred to me, one thing that I could potentially do here. Now, water geometry has a uh, extrusion on it, so I might try and uh, I'll try and get rid of that extrusion. I wonder if, if this has a group here, group one. I wonder if I can just blast that. Group one. Delete and unselect it. Hey, look at that. Great. That group was created all the way back up here, I think, um, to actually isolate the section of water that we needed. So it's persistent. So it stays there and it has allowed me to get rid of that extrude volume. Now I've done that because I don't want to go back and bypass the file cache because the file cache is speeding things up. So that's good. That's still there. If I do a ray here, let's not do minimum distance. Let's do project rays and vector this might actually be easier than uh, what I was thinking. We could just break this expression. Maybe. Oh, it's doing something. It's thinking about it. Hopefully it doesn't crash. Oh, there we go. I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to... Um... How dare I cough? That's right. Um, remember that Remember that stream I did where I was coughing the whole time? And I... Yeah, man. I... That was the worst. Um, ray direction. I'm just going to shoot rays upwards. And the, ray, the way that the ray works is that if it finds something, it's going to hit it and move that point to that location. But because all of these points are below, uh, sorry, are above the surface and the rays are shooting upwards, there's nothing for it to hit. So it will just stay there. So I don't actually need to do all this fancy garbage. It's actually just done it for me. So uh, this is this is what I love. You know, you don't always have to go crazy with the technical stuff. It's just going to move all those points to the top for me. Now, it is actually moving points that weren't there before to the top as well. I'm kind of thinking that that's going to be all right because it's going to actually just give me more foam on the surface. So see all this stuff here is kind of getting moved to the top, which we didn't have before, but I don't know, you know, I think that's, I think that's kind of okay. So yeah, that's cool. Let's, uh, let's have a look and see, see if that actually fixes our problem. Uh, and so that doesn't work anymore. And do, do, do. so that comes out, goes into the render flip. So let's have a look. Render water. Nuke. No, nuke's not difficult. Compared to Houdini, nuke's a dream. 
Nukes, um, Nukes easy, yeah, no, Nukes, fine, I mean, it depends what you want to do, you can obviously get very complex with it, like you can with, um, any software, really, but I think Nuke is way easier to get into than, than Houdini is, um, it's, yeah, it's, it's really straightforward, you, you don't need code to use Nuke for basic stuff, or just for a lot of stuff, like, I don't really use code for anything in Nuke. Occasionally, like, I'll come across some problem where I have to go and find some snippet of Python or something to solve it, or ask somebody that, you know, knows about that stuff, but, uh, yeah, look, not at all, not at all. I mean, you know, it's, you just start somewhere, you start with the basic stuff, and if you're interested in, in going more technical with Nuke, then, uh, then you can. I think one of the hardest things I found with Nuke when I switched from, like, after effects and i'm talking like you know <laughs> 12 what are we 2021 20, i'm talking like 10 years ago maybe i learned nuke for the first time and the hardest thing for me was just that it's not layer based like after effects or other compositing you know those sort of editing programs are um so you don't have like a layer stack but once you get used to the way that it works and the node node based way of compositing, it's it makes more sense. And I go into After Effects now and I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. It's just it feels wrong and clunky to work that way. Especially with what I'm doing with Nuke, which is shot assembly from layers. So um not layers, render passes. So, you know, I've got all my different render passes. And it just makes sense to me, probably because I've been doing it for so long, but it makes sense to me to work this way now. And it's very easy to look at the different layers, turn them off. I hate doing effects in Nuke, like any kind of color correction or anything. It has to go in that effects kind of um, pain, which is just a surreal pain to work with. If you want to turn it on and off or you add things and see what different ones look like, it's just, uh, I find that like a nightmare. It's very clunky and slow. So, yeah, Nuke is super powerful and, and I would say not particularly hard. It would not take you very long to learn how to do this basic compositing, merging, you know. Most of the time we're just kind of taking one layer and merging it over another, so merge. But there are lots of operations like anything, like Photoshop, you know, you have additive things where you can plus or screen you can see when i plus it uh, it just adds the highlights instead so yeah definitely learn it i mean it's oh well it depends you might not you might not really need it, it depends what you want to do but if you um if you're looking to get into film or television or you know commercials or something like that then um yeah it's uh you know you got to kind of use it it's the main it's the main tool for uh for compositing in, in those fields. Um, but I, you know, because I'm, because I'm used to using it, I use it for everything now. Um, when you want to do timeline based stuff, it becomes a little bit more challenging. Nuke is really designed like a kind of, you do one shot in it and then you open a new script for another shot and you do that. And then maybe you take them into a different package to composite, like to edit those two finished shots together. Nuke is really great for just bringing in files, bringing in renders, image sequences, and outputting image sequences. Anything more than that is kind of, it hasn't, it's not really designed for that task. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I wouldn't say it's technical, though. Um, certainly not compared to Houdini. Okay, so I set my render flag on the UV texture. I've got my new and improved flip. And let's go and have a look. So I'll take a snapshot. I think I do have that original snapshot there. Hit render. Let's see what appears. Uh, where should I be using a file cache? As in, what are the best practices? And I need to finally escape the clutches of After Effects. Yes, you do, Alan. Yes, definitely. Uh, look, I mean, there are occasions where After Effects, I'm like, I could use After Effects right now, especially when I'm stitching shots together. Um, I, you know, Nuke is not great for that. You have to, like, create time offsets and things to shift things in time, which is just, yeah, really annoying. 
Um, oh, this is rendering. Look, we got some back. Maybe we didn't get all of it back, though. I suspect that there's still a little bit there under the water. Let's go to the water. Yeah, and I'm just going to turn down the effect of the displacement a little bit and see if that also makes a difference here. Um, file caches. Where should you be using file caches? I think, I think I've mentioned this before. Um, file caches... File caches really should go anywhere where you have a slow operation. So certainly solvers should be file cached because they're slow and you don't want to have to be caching that stuff to memory every time. Like if you, I mean, for this flip simulation, for example, which took hours and hours and hours, I would definitely want to cache that to disk because I don't want to have to redo that every time that I open my file. And I don't want to have to, I don't want to have the renderer have to recalculate that at render time. I want it to just pull that information from disk, assign the shader and render. So, but yeah, basically any time that we have something slow is a good opportunity to file cache. So a slow geometry operation, you can see that I've got some file caches in here, which are not after solvers and they are just after really slow geometry calculations. So this water geo processing, for example, calculating the VDB for this water was a really slow operation. So if I don't have the file caches, these things are just being calculated every frame because the simulation here is referencing these nodes. So it's pulling those in every frame. And if they aren't cached to disk, it has to calculate from all the way. Like if you trace the node graph, you know, back to the object merge and then into this node and it's doing all this stuff. So if you don't cache to disk, it's doing that. It's reading back all the way to the very top where it finds the end of the node before it can even render. So you can imagine if you had really slow operations, you might have like five minutes of just getting the geometry ready to render every frame. And then your render time might be five minutes. So it pushes your render times up to double what they should be. So anytime you have a slow operation like that, you want to cache it. Anytime you have something that's time-based, like a solver or a SOP solver or, you know, something that's caching to memory, that would be something that I would always cache to disk as well. Unless, you know, it's really, really quick and I'm feeling lazy. Um, then, yeah, you can see all these simulations cached to disk. And it gives me the ability to have versions as well. So I can, you know, up the version and then go and re-simulate and then compare the versions. So I've got version three and version four, you know, which one's better, what change, what, you know, what did that change look like when I did it? Um, and the ability to roll back to previous versions if you don't like the new version. So, you know, that that's really useful. And basically, you know, the way that I control that, there are many ways to do version control, but I just do it in the name. So I'm pulling the node names here, $OS. And you can see this is giving me a folder called mist pyro version four and mist pyro version four is the file name as well. But if I, let me just stop this for a second. If I click on this mist pyro and just roll back the name here to three, I'm gonna get a different simulation here. There we go. So there's my version three. Piddly little uh, the steam vents going off. So I thought that was a bit, uh, I thought that was a bit lacking. So I did another version. So. I just control my versions like that. You can do it. You can put sliders on here to control the number and stuff as well. Um, I think I've deleted version one and two, but that's how I control my versioning. And yeah, it's great. You know, and if I want to re-simulate, I'll just change that to version five. Version five doesn't exist, but when I hit save to disk, it will go and create that folder structure because create intermediate directories is turned on. And what that means is any directory that's in this sort of uh, expression here. So slash geo slash dollar OS slash whatever. If they don't exist, they'll get created. So missed version five will get created when I hit save to disk. So that's awesome. You know, it allows me to just control my versions, have multiple ones. Um, hey, 
I want to say sniffles. I, I think that's what, what it is. It doesn't have a double F, but... Um, you downloaded Houdini. Nice. Um, you want to learn simulations? 32 gig? Yeah, 32 gigs enough. Certainly when you're just starting out, you know, you... You can certainly get more RAM, but... Yeah, I mean, 32 gigs, absolutely plenty. Plenty. Even 16 is enough to kind of do a lot of things. Um, you have to be smart about how you utilize things and how you create things, but like I, you know, I have a Surface, Microsoft Surface, you know, a little tiny laptop. It's got 16 gig of RAM. I can do stuff in Houdini on that. And it's not, you know, you just have to be kind of mindful that you're working with limited resources and not try to do things that are outside that kind of realm. And you will learn pretty quickly what is the limit of your laptop or whatever. Um, so yeah, look, more RAM is always better, but it's not, you know, it's not necessary. If I, you know, if my work didn't pay for the RAM that I have, I certainly wouldn't have 128 gig of RAM. I, my previous PC only had 32, I think, or maybe 64. Um, but yeah, RAM's expensive. So, you know, it's, it's kind of, uh, it's quite an investment to bump it up to, to super levels. Um, saying that it is amazing. <laughs> it's, uh, it does really make a difference. Um, I have used Axiom. It's good. You know, I find that I can't get like some of the details and some of the, some of the sort of looks that I, I'm familiar with getting with Pyro and that I like to get, um, it's the same with most of those GPU renderers that are out there. Um, hey, morning, Hardik. Um, most of those GPU renderers that are out there, I find they're good to a certain extent. And when I want more from them, then I start hitting some walls. Um, so yeah, look, they're good. Definitely play around with them. I, I would suggest if you are new to Houdini though, to learn more about the fundamental processes in Houdini and how they work, how to work attributes, how to create geometry, how to, you know, create um, sources and how to visualize data, like learning about the geometry spreadsheet, learning about creating markers, um, learning about, you know, how to make volumes from things before you get into learning third party. Like that's a, Axiom is a plugin, right? It's a third party tool. So, you really need to focus on just Houdini first. And then all those third party things can come later. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, just, just focus on all those fundamental kind of ideas first. I know simulations are like, that's the goal. They're the really fun things to do. And that's how you make the really cool stuff. But, um, if you don't focus on learning fundamentally how to create things, how to create anything in Houdini and skip that stuff, then it's going to, it's going to hurt later where you don't, you get into the simulation land and you don't really know what you have, what you've got and how to manipulate it. You know how to press the buttons on the solver to make the solver do things. But then if you want to go beyond that and make custom stuff, then you kind of get, you might get yourself into a problem and you can't get out of it because you don't really understand what's going on. So I'm talking from experience because that's how I did it. I went straight into simulations. I didn't learn any of that stuff. And, you know, it, uh, it quite, you know, it was quite bad. It hurt me. You know, it was stressful working that way. Um, so I, I highly recommend learning fundamentals first and just starting slow. You try out the pyro stuff, you know, get in there and just have a play. But, um, but yeah, look, there's also, if you're interested in GPU stuff, Definitely have a look at the, if you type, if you tab and type pyro configure GPU explosion, you have this one in, um, in Houdini. So they have this and I'm, I'm expecting that they're going to do more work on this stuff, uh, with further releases and yeah, you know, it's actually quite cool. It's pretty fast as well. And it's a good way to kind of learn how the settings work for the pyro solver. So I'll just hit play in here and this is now playing back real time. So I can go to the solving tab and uh, I don't know, let's choose some settings to tweak. So upping the buoyancy scale, oh, it rises faster. Let's up the lifespan of the flames. Okay, so 
It's hard to see because it clips the bounds, but they're, they're hanging around a bit longer. Let's change expansion. Okay, great. It expands. Let's take that down. Much smaller. Disturbance or oh, turbulence. Let's add turbulence really high. Let's see what we get. Okay, it's a little bit hard to see, but I can see some swirling in there. Oh, there we go. Let's make the swirl size 10. Whoa, crazy. So this is a really good way of just sort of learning how things work in Pyro and just messing around with all the settings. And you can see the results in real time. Now, this, you know, is probably not great for the final result, but just for, just for tweaking and just seeing what, you know, what, um, what it work, what it does and how it works is like, I find this really good. Um, can you do sparse with this? So this is the sparse solver. This is the, well, GPU, I don't know. It's, it is the sparse solver, this one. So if you go to solving advanced, maybe sparsity is actually off for this one. This is the OpenCL minimal solver. It's something different entirely, which is faster than the sparse solver again. Um, but this one, this, this wrapped up version of the, uh, Pyro solver by default is set to sparse. So the thing with sparse is everyone thinks, oh, we'll make it sparse because that's better and it's faster, but it's different as well. You can't get the same sort of details um, or you get a different result with sparse solving. You know, there's, you get stepping quite often, you get blockiness quite often. So it's not like I'll just make it sparse and you know, everything's fine. Uh, it's an option and it's good for certain simulations, but I haven't been able to get like super detailed fire, like how I'm used to getting with the regular PyroSolver using the sparse solver. So I don't use it. Um, and hopefully, you know, things will get better and things will change as they develop these things more and more. But yeah, it's not, there, there are lots of options in Houdini for lots of different things. Some are faster than others but some are also better than others. They might be slower, but it's kind of like, well, that's okay. I'm going for the best result that I'm going for, not necessarily the fastest. Um, so yeah, I mean, that that's just something, speed and simulations are just something that you need to kind of come to terms with. They are slow and there's not, you know, <laughs> there's not a lot of options sometimes. So um, I'm more concerned about the end result than the speed. Uh, obviously, I hate slow simulations as much as anybody else, but um, yeah, uh, if it looks great, then I'm kind of like, well, okay, you know, I can deal with the speed. I just, uh, I want the result to be amazing. Um, and, you know, that's that's what that's what working in film demands of you as well, is that, you know, you are demanded, demanded to create something that looks super realistic and, and, uh, and, you know, without error and, and just as realistic as possible. So if the slow result gives me that, then that's probably what I'm going to choose. Um, all right. All right. So what was I doing? I can't remember. So, so many, so many tangents just then. Is it hard to get into the industry? Sorry, I'm just working my way back through the questions. Um, Instinct 66 says, is it hard to get into the industry? Well, you know, the short answer is yes. Yes, it is. You do have to be, um, you know, you have to have a really good showreel. You have to have the knowledge. Um, there's that old sort of uh, chicken and the egg thing where you have to have experience, but how do you get experience, you know, if you've never worked before? Um, I think, I think the thing, you know, with getting into the industry, whatever industry it is, you just need a really good portfolio and, you will, you know, you will get there if you do have it. Um, it's hard to do that. It's not easy. You're not going to get it, you know, in six months or a year. It's going to take time to build up that portfolio. Um, and yeah, you just, you just need to work at it. Like I, you know, I worked at it for a long time to get my first job. I spent about a year working on my showreel as a job. Like I was nine to, well, it was like almost 24 hours a day, basically just working at 3D, trying to learn as much as possible and trying to create a showreel. Uh, and then I sent that to the film studio of my dreams and uh, they were like, yeah, you know, it's not good enough. But eventually I did get a job. 
at a uh, <laughs> yeah Michael knows all about it um, eventually I got a job at you know a smaller studio and they were willing to take a chance and then once you get in somewhere it's just you know from there as long as you keep proving yourself and keep improving if you get in and then just go well now I can rest on my laurels and do nothing um, you'll you'll probably fall out of the system again but if you keep pushing and keep proving and keep improving then you know you you just climb and you'll jump then from the small studio to the big studio and eventually to where you want to be um but yeah it's you know it's not easy it's it's not easy at all the thing is there are lots of jobs out there for people but you know they're not going to give them to just just anybody you do have to be at a certain level and show that you can if you're talking about film you have to display that you are capable of creating something that is going to be realistic and look, you know, beautiful. So if you have things on your reel that are kind of not like that, then they're going to think twice about it. There's a level where they can think, well, you know, it's, it's not quite there, but I, we can see a lot of potential. So, you know, they take a chance, but yeah, you know, that's, there's a very high bar to a lot of, you know, the reviews in, in real reviews so you're competing against a lot of people and there's a lot of people out there that are doing some some good stuff it's just time you know you need to invest a lot of time into it um, and the more you practice the more you know better you'll get um what's my dream studio uh, i don't i don't really have a dream studio anymore although you know growing up in the uh in the 80s and watching star wars i um I always wanted to work at ILM and I kind of don't really mind anymore that I haven't worked there, but that was always one of my kind of goals. Um, and it's possible for me now, if I really wanted to, I could go and get a job at ILM in Sydney. Um, cause I'm in Australia, but, uh, yeah, I'm kind of not interested <laughs> anymore. It's, uh, it's sort of changed. My goals have changed, but, um, look, there are, there are lots of good studios out there. I think my dream studio these days would be a smaller studio with less people and just a bunch of like really talented people doing amazing content. Um, because that's a lot more fun to me. You know, when you have a giant studio with a thousand people or something and a lot of them are inexperienced, uh, that to me is not a lot of, not a lot of fun, but I don't know. It was fun at a certain time in my life, but not now. Um, but it is a good industry. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to discourage anyone from entering the industry. There's a lot of fun. There's a lot of pressure, but it is also a lot of fun. And the projects are fun. You know, I haven't worked. Uh, I haven't worked in film for well, like a, a year or year and a half or something, and I do miss it. Um, you know, I do miss kind of. Uh, the challenge, I guess, it's a really, it's a really good challenge. It's a problem solving challenge. I get, I get to experience it with, you know, doing this stuff and doing stuff for students at CG Spectrum and teaching and trying to figure out problems and creating little projects. But, um, yeah, you know, it's like this constant challenge and you keep getting given these tasks where you have to solve a problem and produce something that looks, you know, fits in and, and is real. And hopefully the audience doesn't notice. That's the goal. Um, let's see. Do, do, do. What other things did I miss? Yeah, Alan. Um, version control. Good. Version control is good. Um, do, do, do. What else did I miss? Hey, Hardik. Yes, my weekend was good. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Weather was a bit, a bit rainy here. It's still a bit cold, but uh, it was good. Um, all right. So... We've got our ray. Now I just added a little bit to the scale to see if I could bump it up a little bit above the surface. So you have this scale. One is just gonna move it directly to the surface. But if you go above one, it moves it above. You can see how it's raised all this stuff sort of above the surface, which I don't want. I just wanna have it sort of maybe slightly higher. Uh, so the thing that I was doing was taking that displacement down a little bit. So, you know, we're definitely getting some stuff back, 
Maybe I didn't actually do a render of that displacement at 0.9. Let me let me turn that on again. Take a snapshot. Lost my train of thought. Sorry. Um, no worries, Instinct. Hope it helps. I mean, just keep keep at it. If you you know if you have a goal, if you're trying to get somewhere, just keep going and don't stop until you, you know, until you get there. What frame was I on before? I was on a different frame, 205. Oops. Stop. There we go. Go back to 205 and hit render. Yeah, Michael, you know all about you know all about it. It takes time. I think I think, you know, one of the hardest things uh, to teach or to get across when you're teaching is that it's going to take a significant amount of investment from a student to get to the point where they have a, you know, a quality show reel that can be sent out. Um, I think it's learning the software is one thing, but then, you know, actually getting, getting to the point where, you know, you have a whole bunch of really kind of amazing projects at a, at the level that film studios are demanding, it, it takes time, you know, it takes time producing them. It takes a long time to kind of produce these effects. As you can see, like this is nowhere near done. I've only been working on it for, uh, you know, a couple of hours a day, really. Uh, well, a couple of hours a week, I should say, because I usually just do this stuff on the streams and there may be a little bit of extra work, but you know, I've been working on this for five weeks. It just, it takes time to, uh, to kind of put this stuff together and to keep refining, keep polishing it. And then the hardest part is, you know, you'll get six months down the track and you've created some extra projects that look really good. And then you go back and look at the stuff that you had previously and you're like, oh, well, that doesn't really look as good now. And then you have to do more. So you're just kind of constantly improving. Um, yeah, it's just this constant, <laughs> this constant exercise of improving and, and trying to create more and more better work. Um, the goal for me when I was learning was just always to create realism, you know, and just trying to learn as much as I could about creating things that looked real. So that's, you know, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to work in film and that's kind of the goal with film. All right. So you can see now getting a little bit of stuff, a little bit higher, take another snapshot. I'm going to take this down to 0.8, see what see what this does. Well, it's interesting. It looks like I'm actually losing some of it when I do that. Maybe not. Do I use GPU for rendering? Yeah, sometimes. I do have Redshift. Um, but one of the things I don't like about GPU renderers in Houdini is that they're not completely hooked in, like you, you have to use all Redshift nodes, for example, if I was using Redshift. So I find that a little bit hard sometimes. It depends. So this, this would be easy to do in Redshift because I'm not doing really anything custom here, apart from the, um, the volume shader that I made, but, um, th this scene would be perfectly fine to, uh, to do with Redshift. But quite often, I'm, I'm often doing a lot of volume stuff and volume rendering in Redshift is just a real pain. It's not, not easy to get a good looking shader. So I tend to default to Mantra because it's easy and I don't have to do a lot of setup. Um, Karma? Nah, jury's still out on that. It's in beta and I'm not touching it until they fix a lot of the errors that, um, you know, that it has. Again... The thing I don't like about Karma is that you have to rebuild the kind of environment, like you have to bring everything into the Karma context, the stage context, to set it up for Karma. I just don't want to do it because it's learning something new, but I will kind of push myself to learn Karma eventually. Um, but the last time I tried it, it was super buggy and clunky to get going. And I just like, I, I know I can get a result with Mantra. It's slow. It's so slow, but 
I know that I know what I'm going to get. So for me, it's kind of like, uh, it's one of those things where, you know, when I'm working on a project, I've done my simulations. I just need to get my render out and then I'm done instead of mucking around with, you know, trying to set it up in karma and trying to figure out this thing. And then there's all these errors and maybe I can't do something that I wanted to do. Then I end up abandoning that and what, like I will have wasted time. So I just go with the thing that I know works and obviously that's not a very progressive kind of mindset. Um, and I should learn it, but in terms of commercial, you know, work, it's, you know, it's not something at the moment that's ready for what I need to get out of it. Um, Hey, thanks computer tricks. Guruji. Thank you. Um, nice to see you. Um, yeah, look, I, I hope karma will improve and I hope the integration will improve so that I, you know, it's less kind of separate to everything else. That's what I don't like about it. Um, but you know, maybe it's just, I just need to change. <laughs> I just need to change the way that I work. I will learn it cause I'll have to teach it at some point. Um, so I'll, I'll try and get my head around it. That's probably time, but, but it is still in beta. If you have a look, you know, they are, they are still working on it. So, um, yeah, I'm hoping that a lot of those problems that it has get, get kind of smoothed out. Um, Raneem says, I've been trying to do the flip plus RVD. We couldn't get good results. Um, do you, do you mean the, uh, which, which flip RBD are you talking about? Did I do flip RBD? I can't remember. It's on so many streams now. Um, are you talking about like the wave, the wave one? Um, uh, how do you approach a scene? Like something comes out from the water and it breaks the upper RBD layer. Right. So are you, would you, would you be meaning like if this came out of the water, for example, and then the ship kind of broke apart as it was coming out of the water. Is that, is that kind of what you meant? Where are we at? Let's have a look at this render. It's weird. You know, some parts of this uh, displacement went up and some went down. So I don't know what's going on there. Overall though, it's not bad. Yeah. Hmm. What could we do? What could we do? What could we do? I guess we would really have to render this out to see. Let's let's just do well Raneem is uh hopefully giving me some clarification. Let's um let's just render out a couple of a couple of frames of this. So I'm gonna go to two oh two. Don't need to render the whole thing, just this kind of area. And I have to decide what I'm going to work on next week as well. Um, I do have this big list of things and I know, uh, I know some people have been waiting for pyro, which I haven't done for a while. Sure, I've done some pyro at some point. Maybe not. Little bits and pieces here and there. Um, so I might do some sort of explosion. Although I don't want to just do an explosion. I think that's kind of, you know, that's a little boring. I want to do something else. So I might combine it with some RBD stuff. Um, all right. So here's the list. If you want to have a look at it. Live every Sunday. Yep. Every single day, uh, not every single day, every single Sunday. Yeah. I mean, it's Monday morning for me in Australia, but, um, for you and, uh, people like you in the Northern hemisphere, you're back in time. Isn't that exciting? I'm in the future. Um, yeah, every, every week, same time. Imagine these ships seen happening in a snowy environment. The ship comes out from the water, but there is a snow. Oh, I see. Wow. 3 a.m. Sniffles. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for joining me at 3 a.m. Um, that's amazing. 
yeah well at uh at 3 a.m every uh well i guess i started an hour ago but um every week i'm always here so please join me if you can um imagine these ships in a snow environment the ships come out from water but there is a snow layer to also break that does sound cool sounds very cool um so what, what is the part that you're struggling with, the RBD, or just the general approach? Um, I can, yeah, I can take a quick stab at it. Let's just, let's just do some quick renders here. So I'm just going to snapshot 202, go to 203. I'm going to pop open a new Houdini while that's happening. And we can... Uh, can have a little look at that rename. That's uh, that does sound like a very cool kind of idea. It doesn't. I mean, it doesn't immediately seem super complicated to me. So I'm not sure if um, the snow is not floating on the flip. Oh, I see. So I guess. I guess I probably wouldn't do it like that like where it's all in one simulation maybe um is the whole thing just covered in snow like is it ice a kind of ice sheet is the whole thing covered or is it like patches that should be sort of floating and undulating on the surface because that i guess is more tricky than just a flat sheet that's not moving um but is it, yeah, is it kind of just floating on the surface in patches? Is that sort of what it is? Alright, so snapshot that. Big ice floor above the flip. Right, so is the ice floor actually moving though? Does it need to, does it need to move? Okay, so we got one, two. Oh, it's the same frame. The beginning of the ship sort of looks like the Millennium Falcon. Yeah, it does kind of. It's got a spaceshipy vibe. I mean, a sorry, Star Warsy vibe to it. This spaceship. Yeah, yeah, I I understand that, Renim. I guess the. Uh, the question that I'm asking is, does the ice floor need to move? You were saying that you um, you did some R&D, but the snow is not floating on the flip. So I guess what I'm asking is, does the ice, before it's broken, need to move? Or can it be static? Because if that's the case, I probably wouldn't do the RBD sim in the same simulation as the flip sim because that would be much harder to control. Um, I'll, I'll open it and, uh, and see. I'll open up a new Houdini and we'll, we'll have a little look. So I'm just trying to determine whether this is... Oops, I just skipped frames again. I'm trying to determine whether this is working at it. I mean, it does seem to have sort of fixed that popping that was going on there. You can see that's not really popping anymore. So I think that's good. I'm going to say... That that's done. Um, all right, cool. Well, let's let's put a pin in this and say that it's pretty much done. There's a few things that need to be kind of fixed in terms of integration. You know, the the mist is too quick coming off the ship, so I'm going to slow that simulation down. The flip points, the flip streams. You know, they could be a finer simulation. They're a bit too uh, sparse, I guess, that these should be a lot closer together, these points, so they feel like streams of water, or they're probably maybe a little big as well. Um, the flip simulation itself, I think, is working pretty well. Again, could be more points. This popping, hopefully, we've fixed now. Um, yeah, so I think, I think overall, you know, it's not too bad, but there are certainly some things to fix. Certainly that, you know, does not look great. Let's turn that one off. 
this stuff could be a little finer, maybe that would help. And yeah, you know, as I was saying at the start, some bubbles or something might, might really help this look a bit more integrated and maybe some displacement on the surface of the water before it surfaces. So I'm going to take a look at those things. I don't know if I'll do it this week, but I'll, I'll give you guys an update when I've got something new for that. Um, and hopefully, hopefully at least the flip is fixed. So let's, let's have a little look-see at this idea. I keep meaning to uninstall uh, this color configuration. So, hey Michael, thanks for joining me. Have a good week. Happy Sunday. So, Renee, feel free to jump in at any point when I'm doing this and tell me this is not what you want. But this is what I'm thinking for the effect. This is my ice shelf. Maybe, yeah, something like that. Uh, now, I'm going to also create a flip tank underneath that. So, I'm just going to use the shelf tool to do this just because it's a little bit easier and quicker to get going. So, uh, let's see, where would I find that? I never use the shelf tools, so I can never find these things. Let's go flat tank. Object to follow. I don't have an object to follow. Select position. I just really wanted it at world zero. There we go. So I've got a flat tank. Let me just set this center to zero. And I'll set this to 10 by 10. So it should match. All right. And you have a, I hate uh, dot networks, auto dot networks, but that's all right. Um, and you have a ship breaking through. So uh, let's see. I've got a ship here somewhere. Let me find it. Shot kit, pirate ship. Here we go. Oh yeah. Transform. I don't know what sort of ship you have. Is it a spaceship? I kind of, uh, I, I pictured a sailing ship for some reason. I hope that's okay. The process is obviously exactly the same, no matter what sort of object it is, but um, let's do something like this. Parts of the caravan in the snow. I'll take it a little bit smaller. Okay. Okay. And it's going to do a little animation. Got our simulation displayed, so I'm just going to hide other. And Alright, pretty lame animation, but uh, there we go. Yeah, this will, uh, for our purposes, that should be fine. Let me just uh, actually coast, drop it down a little bit. Oops. Whoa, okay, there we go. Whoa, too fast. Okay. Crappy animation. All right. Let's say that. Yeah, it is a cool ship, isn't it? I don't know where we got. I think this came from CG Trader. I'm not sure. Um, let's drop it down a little more. There we go. All right. So first things first, first things first, I'm going to, let's put a trail on this. Let's see, what have we got? It's, I don't need to unpack it. It's just polygons and points. So trail, velocity. So that gives me all my velocity. Now for anyone that wasn't sure what I meant when I meant create markers before when I was, talking about learning fundamentals. 
marker attribute v is the velocity set it to vector so style is vector attribute is v that's what compute velocity does on the trail and then it will actually show me that as a vector in the viewport so i can see that that velocity is actually working so it's important to kind of do that just to check then uh just the same as the ship that we've done rising out of the water let's go out and call this one out geo and then i'm going to do a vdb from polygons here whoops vdb from polygons like that oh five let's say doesn't need to be super high res that should be fine null out vdb now i'm going to go actually i'll call it ship go to my flip sim static object merge swap those inputs swap path slash obj slash ship out geo used to forming geometry collisions volume sample proxy volume slash obj slash ship out bdb all right done that a million times so if i turn off my display geometry turn off my ghosts uh, turn on turn hide other objects off you can see that i've got a collision representation but it's a little bit kind of crappy offset surface just offset it a little bit till it starts to fill in and look like a nice solid shape there we go looks pretty good let's hit play Not a lot of uh, water being dragged up, but oh, there we go. I mean, yeah, it's a super low res simulation as well, so it's not going to kind of show a lot of interesting splashes. So there's our water simulation, right? Now the next thing that I would do is, uh, I mean, you could you could do RBDs and flip together. We can. If I've got half an hour, so I'll try and show you. Um, so. Here's my ice. Let's fracture it. Vrono fracture. Scatter. Just gonna do a very simple kind of fracture. Okay. And then I'm just gonna use a SOP based RVD bullet solver. So whoever you wanna do a, a, a simulation is up to you. I would probably do it in a dot network with a bullet solver uh, and an RBD packed object and some constraints, but uh, you know, just actually this node probably is going to be fine. Um, this is just a wrapped up version of the solver inside. So for simple stuff, this is okay. Now I'm going to object merge my, uh, my ship, my ship geo. And I'm going to, this one, collisions, this one I can probably just plug this in and see what happens. So I'm going to plug it into the collision geometry tab and just see what I get. Looks okay. Collisions, convex hull. It's weird. So that's a weird collision shape that's showing me. It should really not look like that, but uh, whatever. Let's, let's see what happens. Uh, I'm going to hit play. This is going to fall down at the moment. Yeah, uh, you can see my ship isn't moving, but it's it's colliding, so that's a good start. Let's turn off gravity and go to collisions, deforming static. There we go. No gravity, so the ice is not falling down. The ship now is moving because I set it to deforming, and Okay, so we got that. It's a good, good start. Now, really, I do want this ice to fall down, but I don't want it to fall down before the ship breaks. So I could, you know, maybe set a constraint to hold it together. Um, in production to these, the Houdini default RBD tools like Material Fracture or other new RBD tools or custom setup. Uh, it, it, it really depends. It depends on the artist. Um, I don't use material fraction nodes. They're incredibly slow and I just 
cannot stand how slow they are. I have, you know, processes that I use for creating different types of fractures. Um, quite often though, I will just use a Vorano fracture and then maybe add extra details to it or mess with it in such a way that it gives me some interesting results or do like levels of refracturing to create that same stuff. Um, there are some good things in the RBD material fracture, but the slowness of it just kills me and uh, I, I just can't, <laughs> I can't use it. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of old school techniques being used. You know, it's just people have been in the industry. They, like I was saying before with rendering, you know, it works and it works well and it's hopefully not particularly slow. Um, so we just keep using the things that work. There's no need to change. Um, if some like amazing thing came out, the RBD material fracture, for example, got really fast, then I would probably use it if it was quick. But um, but yeah, I just can't. I can't use it. It's too slow. Um, but yeah, it, it really depends on the artist. There's no like rules. Um, I mean, some studios might have some rules, but there's no there's no real rules. I'm gonna add the ground plane, and I'm just gonna take it down by 0.1, and you can see now the ice shelf is sitting on that ground plane. And then if I hit play, then it's not gonna fall. So I, did I turn gravity back on? I think I did. No, I didn't. Let's turn gravity back on. Negative down point eight. So it really depends on the type of shot, what you want to do with this ice. I assume you want it to kind of like fall back into the water and splash. So we'll look at that too. But now you can see I've got, you know, a ship bursting through some RBDs. Um, perhaps, you know, perhaps it would look more icy if I actually had less. Um, less pieces and it was actually kind of more breaking up these shelves of ice and obviously this is very simplistic but you know you could think about adding detail to these so then you get these kind of interesting things maybe you want to play with things like mass and uh, gravity and also constraints so you know we have here constraints coming out of the Voronoi fracture but we could put down an RVD constraint um, properties node hook that up and create maybe a soft constraint that constrains these pieces together so let's go plug that constraint output into the bullet solver we'll go to our constraints tab soft should be something being created hopefully let's see what happens we've got breaking happening as well so let's see if this kind of uh it might actually all just lift up together. There you go. So you can see they're all kind of constrained together. Let me just put the distance threshold way down. The type of constraint that's being output is probably not ideal. Um, so I possibly wouldn't just rely on the constraint coming out of the Voronoi fracture for this. But, you know, you can see when things are constrained together, they create interesting results. Possibly as well, this plane is very small. So... You know, maybe we should just make it bigger and then the edges hopefully won't lift up as much. Let's see. Probably my fractured pieces are just a little bit too small. But you can see now, like the edges do kind of lift up a little bit, but not, they kind of drop back down as well. Wow, awful. All right, let's give it, let's go 100. Maybe that will be a good size. So, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, obviously I don't know the full story of this effect and what you, exactly what you want, but it's worth thinking about, you know, what exactly do you need? Do you need the RBD and the flip to be solved together? Can you just do something like this where the RBD now would be coming out? It's uh, coming out as polygons, which is good. So I'm going to call this out ice. I'm then going to VDB from polygons that. And yeah, that'll probably be all right. Call that one out ice VDB. Jump back to my dot network. Copy my static object here, merge it back together. 
This one's going to be ice. Out ice. That's my geometry. There it is. And the same here. Ice. Out ice VDB. There we go. So these are pretty slow to calculate, so turn the collision guides off. Now this is going to be a collider for my flip. So quite often when you need things to interact, especially with flip, a lot of the time you just want things to collide with flip and then, so the flip is gonna now splash onto the rest of the ice that hasn't broken. Right? And I mean, you could think about it. There's lots of ways that you could think about it. You could think maybe you don't have a ground plane and maybe you just deactivate these edge pieces of the ice so they can't fall. And then you could have the pieces of the ice that do break. If they do plop back down here, they might fall into the water, which might be interesting. Um, but you can see the water is now spreading out onto the ice. So that's probably the way that I would approach it, where I've got the flip sim just using collisions to drive a lot of the behavior. And I mean, yeah, these ice fragments are really, really, really large. So let's, let's just have a quick look at how we could maybe get them to fall back in the water. So at the moment they're breaking and then they're falling back down. And if they hit the ground, they're just going to sit on the ground plane. But uh, perhaps, let's see, give this more fractures. Get 500. Let's see what that does. Um, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I'm going to do a custom force here. Let's try that. Solver, forces. I'm going to set gravity to zero. I'm going to go inside and do a pop force because it's uh, RBD's bullet is points um, instance with geometry. So I can do pop forces. So I'm going to set the gravity to negative 9.8, which is you know, gravity. Then I'm going to say if at p dot y is less than uh, zero force. So it's called force here, force y force y equals zero. Oops. So what this is going to do is gravity is going to be on 9.8, but if the p dot y value of these pieces is below zero, the gravity value will be zero. Let's see what happens. I'm going to turn off the ground plane and see. I might need to adjust that threshold because these pieces are sort of sitting half on zero and half half above, half below, so I might actually need to adjust my position there. Let's see what happens. Do they fall down? Oh, error, great. Um, I guess I messed something up here. If force.y equals zero. What doesn't it like about that? I guess I wrote it wrong. Oh, force y. Maybe I'll just do force times equals. Zero. Let's see if that works. Hey, there we go. So you can see they did get pulled down a little bit, but once they're sort of completely below zero, then the force just stops and they stop moving, but they have a little bit of inherited velocity. But you can see all these pieces above, they're going to shoot up and then fall down. And you can see them falling below, but then what happens is they fall kind of below and then slow down. So there's a lot of sort of wobbling and stuff going on, which actually might be really interesting when you put it in as a collision object to the flip. It might kind of look quite cool. But what I'm going to do as well is, I guess, you know, one thing that we could do here is instead say, uh, let's see. You can actually do this just in a um, just in a wrangle as well, like pop wrangle. So you could say at force dot y or if 
at p dot y is greater than zero. Let's just do 0 0.1, so it's over the zero area. If p dot y is greater than 0 0.1, at force dot y equals negative 5.8. Let's see if that works. So these pieces that pop up here, they should fall down, hopefully. If force dot y is, is actually a thing. Let's see. They do look like they're kind of falling, maybe. They do look like they're just flying off into space forever. So maybe force dot y is not the correct attribute. Let me just make that minus 90 just to force it and see in particle land force dot y would work but possibly in rbd land it's not correct i don't know i can't remember it's been a while since i've done that they just look like they're flying off so i'm going to say that that's Probably not working. You can just do V, but let's let's try force equals. Uh, hey sniffles, yeah, I think yeah, I'll be doing some sort of pyro next week. Um, I don't know what it'll be. It'll it'll be another project, I think. Um, and yeah, it'll probably be an explosion of some sort, but some sort of twist, <laughs> I don't know, something, ex something exploding, well, let's put it that way. Thanks for joining me, I know it's late there for you, so, or, or early, um, so thanks for, thanks for staying up. Alright, is this working? Maybe force dot y, maybe force just doesn't work with, uh, with RBDs, or maybe it's because I'm inside the solver, or the the subnet. Let's see. You can also turn on drag, which is probably a good thing to turn on. Because that will slow some of those things down from flying off into infinity. Yeah, it just kind of doesn't really look like gravity is, uh, is happening there at all. I don't know what the hell's going on there. I thought I thought force should work unless I need to declare it like that. Let's just do negative 100. P dot y greater than 0 0.1. Obviously making some sort of some sort of error. Sometimes sometimes it's confusing because sometimes when you jump between solvers, like some things work for certain solvers and then other things don't work for others. I guess in this case, force is not the attribute. One way to check would be to just turn this off. And I guess this is why I don't love using the RBD bullet solver when I have something custom that I want to do like this. It's harder to diagnose these issues. But if I come and find the dot network, and then have a look at the geometry spreadsheet, hit play. Here's my RBD object. If I come down and go to geometry, have a look at what attributes are on here. And there is no force attribute. By the looks of it, no force. There is V though. So Probably what is happening inside the solver is that force is being added to V, the force vi um, the force uh, variable or the force kind of attribute that's being created in the pop force is probably being output as V. You can see here it's being output as force. So that's what I was trying to do. But uh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know why it's not working. Um, it should work but perhaps there's something else going on in here that's making it not work. Ah, oh, well. Um, but anyway, that's that's a good way to check. 
like just to go into your bullet solver and have a look at the attributes that are present on your geometry. You can see no force. There's a forces tab here. Yeah, that's right. I, I mean, you could certainly make the edges inactive um, or constrained to something to make them stop moving. Um, that would certainly work as well. So I guess what I was trying to do though was to have, yeah, to have them. I guess, yeah, you're right. The, um, the constraint would probably mean that I don't have to do this. So I could just turn gravity back on and let's do this. So the, I'm not packing these going in here. This node does the packing for me, but I can actually, I think I should be able to pack them and do all that here. So let's do an assemble, create pack geometry, turn off the name because we already have a name and then create a group in the center. So group based on points, keep in bounding regions. So all this stuff is going to be the active stuff. All this stuff I'm selecting, all these pieces are going to be the active pieces. And then this section on the outside is going to be inactive. So I'm going to say in an attribute wrangle, let's call this group active. Oh, 15 minutes left. Um, let's call this group active and we'll say I at active equals uh, zero for everything. And then I could do this in the same wrangle, but I just do this. It's a little bit easier. Two wrangles. The second wrangle makes this active equals one. So anything inside the group is going to be active and anything outside the group is going to be inactive. Also doing it in two wrangles makes it clear what's going on here. So active equals zero. Whoops. Active zero and then active group one. All right. Let's see. We've got under bullet object override attributes from SOP. Active is turned on. Let's see what happens. We've got gravity turned on. Oh, we can see the center is falling down though. So yeah, still not entirely um, perfect. As you can see, it's all just falling down. What could I do? What could I do? You know, another thing you could try with the force stuff is, it's weird that this isn't working, but one thing that you could try is to say, if the length, length V at V is greater than, let's say one, some value, just choose one. Then we'll say at force Y, equals negative 9.8. Let's try that. I don't know why this, yeah, why this is not working. Let's see, do we have a, we've got some options here for presets. So let's just take a look at those, make sure I'm not doing anything wrong. See force times equals, yeah, it's all kind of fine. Force Y maybe is the wrong thing. Maybe it should be force dot Y, but up here it does say force Y. That's what I was going with. Maybe it's force dot y. Let's try that. Uh, and we could even just comment this out and say force dot y equals negative 9.8 and see if that actually works. Oh, there we go. So even though up here it says force y, it is actually force dot y. Okay, let's do if length v at v greater than one, force dot y equals negative 9.8. And that is erroring because I think I have not enough brackets. There we go. So what this should do is, and I think I actually also have gravity on out here. Turn that off. So what this should do is only apply gravity when things are moving. So length V at V greater than one is basically gonna measure the speed. So length V at V gives me the magnitude of the velocity. And when it's greater than one, 
it's going to apply that gravity. So these ones hopefully will fall down. They are, looks like they are going into space, but some of them are falling down. I can see this one now is falling down. So probably they just have like a huge amount of velocity that's carrying them off into space. But you can see this one here falling down. All these other ones though, they're sort of just sort of hanging in there. They're not rising or falling. Let's up the drag on this air resistance. I'm going to go 0 0.1. See if we can get them to slow down a little bit more. So we don't have a ground plane. So things can potentially fall below the surface and into the water, which is what we want. Drag's a bit stronger now, so hopefully maybe they'll slow down and fall down quicker. There we go. I can see this one approaching its apex. And look, starting to fall down. Great. These ones are going crazy. They must be really high velocities coming from the ship. We can also change this threshold. So greater than 1, you know, maybe greater than 0 0.1. So it only has to move a little bit for this gravity to take over. And the gravity as well, you know, 9.8 is the correct gravity, but kind of whatever. It doesn't matter. As long as it does what we want, that value could be whatever it has to be. It doesn't, doesn't always have to be um, negative 9.8. All right. So now we can see we've got falling going on. And some of the ice is here is falling below. And look at all this stuff falling down. So there's quite a lot of it has kind of broken away. So maybe that threshold, you know, we should kind of change it. Maybe that is too, too kind of uh, low. So we want to want it to move a bit more. Let, let's do one. Maybe one was okay. You could even do it much higher. Um, are there any passengers in the boat? I don't know, Rizwan. That's uh, that's really up to you. There aren't technically any passengers on this boat, but. Uh, if you want to, uh, if you want to imagine that there are, then um, by all means. So you can see when it's at, um, when it's at one, we get much less falling below. But basically, it's going to be driven by how much these things move, and when that velocity gets calculated, then it's going to sort of drive that stuff. <laughs> all seafood themed, Captain Crabstick. Um, so yeah, I mean these these are crazy strong. So I, what I would say is that the velocity of this ship is too high, or just needs to be turned down a little bit. Let's go velocity scale point one on the um, trail there. Probably my animation is just a little bit too quick on the ship rising. It should just be a lot slower for the scale. Um, let's see. Now I've got like the, I don't know, in, in Australia we have a food company called Bird's Eye and they have a fish finger ad where there's like some sea, sea shanty and now I have that theme song stuck in my head. Thanks, Audrey. Um, Captain Bird's Eye, I think, is the, is the song. Yeah, these are crazy. I don't know what's going on there with the, with the crazy bouncing. Maybe, maybe it's the bounce, actually. Could be. They just look like they're flying off in space, which is odd. Um, add drag. <laughs> let's, let's crank the drag up and add drag spin. Let's see if that helps. Obviously, the outside ones are being constrained together, so yeah, we don't have to worry about them as much. Set the air resistance to one. There we go. Now they're really dragging is good yeah it's weird the gravity just doesn't really seem to be wanting to play ball it was certainly working at some point but um how the brake rbd float on water rather than going down to water so yeah i mean rbds and flip that's a whole nother kettle of fish and it's it is a really hard thing to control um so where's my Where's my flip here? So, you know, we would have to rebuild this. So let me just go and grab my 
ice here. Null. Out. RBDs. Let's do an RBD packed object. Flip object. Oh, not flip object, sorry. Board solver. Merge. Merge. Uh, you can set it to mutual, the merge, because they're sort of both affecting each other. The gravity here is going to be affecting both at the moment, but you could have separate gravities for RVDs and flip if you wanted to. This one is going to bring in the ice RVD. There we go. So we turn off one of these. Uh, this one is the ice. So yeah, the feedback scale on the volume solver tab is going to be how much effect the flip has on the RBDs. The RBDs should collide with the flip. So if I hide this, we should see, see this weird display that you get with RBDs and flip. So you can see the RBDs are affecting the flip. They're doing something, they're passing some velocity there, but the flip is not affecting the RBDs at the moment. So you can see they're just falling down. Currently, the ship is colliding, which is good. That's a good start. Let's turn the feedback scale onto one. There you go. So the flip is in this area, at least, pushing that stuff up and keeping it a little bit buoyant. But the bounding box is the bounds of the flip. This one. So that's the container for the fluid only. So the flip is kind of affecting the RBDs here. You can see you get a different result now with having the flip in there. It is actually pushing it. But based on the density of the RBDs, that's the thing that's driving how much this is going to fall. So you want to play with you want to play with the density. Maybe you need much less density so that the ice floats on the surface. Wow. There we go. That's crazy. So that's that's your feedback scale of the flip, just like they're basically intersecting, I think, probably they need to actually be slightly separated. Oh no, they are they are separated, so that's interesting. Um yeah, you need to kind of play with the density values, but also what I've found is that having separate forces for both and maybe doing custom forces on the RBD side is a good idea to try and control what that's going on what's going on there uh red in the bounding box red just means uh that you have it selected i think so like that you can see it's selected that's it it's able to be moved that's why it's red i think that's what you mean um so let's see now i've got a lower gravity on my rbd pieces so they're not falling as much. They're gonna shoot off into space, but you can see they're not being pulled down as much by the um, by the gravity that was affecting the flip. So that already gives me greater control for you know being able to manage the um, RBDs. But still, I would have to come up with some solution for this. Look, I've I've done this you know with RBDs and a boat before and had the two things working together but it was incredibly complicated to actually get it to work well. And I had to create a lot of custom forces on the RBD side to actually get it to do what I wanted. By itself, it's incredibly difficult to, um, to actually get the result from just using feedback scale. You wanna, you wanna have custom forces driving it so that you, know, you, just, you don't get all this kind of stuff going on. Um, uh, I don't know what you mean, Rizwan, by that. The colors are kind of just user interface colors. They don't really, they're not really representing anything at this, at this point. Um, so, you, you know, you can see that there are some effects happening here with the fluid, but it's, you know, 
it's just going to sink. It's not sort of floating on the surface and it becomes really, really quite difficult to, to get that to work. So let's, let's take the particle separation down a little bit and see if that has an impact because the resolution will affect how that RBD sits because that's going to affect the volume that it's using as well. Um, Hey Adam, uh, can the RBDs have an active attribute transferred by the ship? Yeah, exactly. They absolutely could um, do that. That was that was something I was thinking. So you could have a solver um, that was transferring active from the ship onto the RBD pieces, so they only break where the ship pierces. Um, that would absolutely work. But you're still going to have the problem of once they are active what happens to them um but it may yeah it may work a little nicer so you know have a have a sop solver in here use instead of the rbd bullet solver use the um use the rigid body solver set to bullet yeah yeah long time no see that's right i'm good i'm good good back in houdini again how are you doing did you stream this weekend um, so what am I going to do? I'm going to object merge the boat in object merge, um, ship out geo. So I've got my dot net here. I've got my ship. Let's just create an active attribute on here with an attribute wrangle and say at active equals one and then I'm going to attribute transfer. We go, oh, 12 o'clock, run out of time. Beaten by the bell. Um, I'm gonna transfer active. And let's just set kind of a stream Saturday, Sunday, tonight. Wow, three in, three in a row, madman. Um, on the ice, I'm just gonna set the active to zero instead of having any activated pieces here. Just going to set it all to zero in this section. And then in the solver, I'm going to activate it. So I'm transferring active equals one from the ship to the pieces based on a distance of one meter, which may be too big. I don't know. Let's play it and see. Wow, five per stream. That's, uh, that's intense. I can see how you could do it, though. I would need to take some breaks. I don't know if you take breaks during the streams, but... About two hours. Around about this time, I need to go to the toilet or have a drink or something. <laughs> um, hey, Zoe, I'm good. How are you? I Long time no see. I haven't seen you around for a few streams, Zoe. Hope you're doing well. Um, so there we go. There's Looks like there's some activation there from the ship, but maybe that, maybe that transfer is a bit crazy. Um, one, let's do 0 0.5. Transferring active... I might just need to set this to be static as well. Yeah, that's right. I guess it forces you, uh, Adam, to just commit and, and just work rather than being distracted by uh, all the fun things that you have in your room, like arcade cabinets and 8-track cassettes. Um, yeah, no, it's all right. I mean, you do get through a lot. I find that I can get through a lot this way as well. But certainly you could get through a lot in 10, 10 or 5 or 10 hours. Well, we're getting a lot of activation here, so this isn't quite working. But that's that's the idea. Um, I don't know why that's not working. Let me see. Yeah, RBDs active should just be zero. Um, who do any things? Oh, is your lap laptop is Linux. That's cool. Um, I'd love to have a Linux at home. I'm just not that technically minded to set it up. Although I find, yeah, it's probably not that hard. Um, but I like Linux. It's good. I use it at work quite a bit. Uh, attribute transfer active. I don't know why this isn't working. Oh, you know what? It's probably because I didn't declare that as an integer and it was probably creating a float attribute. This time. Here we go. 
here we go yeah so now none of that is activating just under the ship is activating just that area around the ship looks like we probably need to just bust that open a little bit uh, yeah good uh, good point sorry I I try to keep this computer my my work computer free of uh, as many distractions as possible although the internet is always there so that's the main one for me um, all right so the, yeah this is a good call good call Adam I think um, I think this is probably a good way to go I guess you want to probably con combine it with some constraints and then transfer a bigger area so that you're activating a larger area but they're kind of more constrained together so they can create some flexibility and then this should just be able to fall back down and splash into the water, you know, where it, where it needs to. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, I haven't seen Smarter Everyday Nuclear Sub-Series. I haven't seen that. Is that in Houdini? That sounds cool. Um, so, yeah, let's have a look at these pieces that have fallen into the water. You can see they're not floating. They're just going to sink. And that is where you're going to run into issues, is trying to get that stuff working. But there are, you know, there are pop nodes that you can try and use with the rigid body solver or the bullet solver. You've got pop float by volumes. That can be an interesting one to try where, let's just merge these things together. Basically, you can specify your um, flip object. I think that's what you do flip object it's going to grab the surface field and the velocity field from the flip and use it to control the floating of rbd pieces um irl educational series oh right <laughs> an actual sub that's cool um i have to i have to have a look for reference so yeah pop float by volumes will cause you know, RBDs or particles is what it's designed for, but it works for RBDs, to when they're below the surface field, it will give them a buoyancy force, push them up. But once they're above, it stops applying that buoyancy force. It also will advect those pieces by the velocity of the um, flip. So, you know, potentially, rather than using the feedback scale, you could bring the data from flip over to the RBD side and control it that way. And that then is probably going to give you a little bit more control and allows you to really dial in the sort of floating. You can see here we're getting a bit of floating above, so I probably need to play with this setting a little bit. But what you can see happening here is that as those pieces go below, even these pieces that are kind of sitting on top, they're sort of getting a force which is putting them up, pushing them up. And you can set the level of that water. So this has a kind of isosurface which you can pull into the negative or you could decrease the buoyancy strength. Maybe you only need it to be one. You could also have no velocity advection because we are doing feedback scale over here. So I would play around with that as well. Get the, get the um, kind of get the pop float by volumes in and see if you can sort of work that out. Isosurface you can play with to sort of push the surface above or below where it needs to be. So doing it in the negative will actually push it downwards more, which might work better. But uh, yeah, doing it this way is incredibly fiddly, I find. So I would probably try to avoid it if possible. Um, but if that's if that's what you're going for, then, you know, you might just need to come up with some custom solutions to make the ice look like it's floating properly when it comes back down. Uh, or maybe it splashes down and then rises up. So, because it's buoyant. So let's see. See this one? This one's broken free. It's active. And it looks like it's sinking but it might stop at some point sinking. I've only got this buoyancy value of one, so it might not be strong enough to keep it completely up. 
But it might. It might also come down a little bit and then rise back up. But it is also fighting against the gravity that's there, so you might just need to find that kind of value that works. But you can see there's, you know, there's quite a nice feeling there of those pieces that are breaking off. They are sinking, so you know perhaps you just need to find that nice value that's going to keep them buoyant at the surface. I've also dropped this val this level down as well, so you know you might need to play with that. Um, but there you go. That's you know obviously very quick, but that's my that's the way I would approach solving the problem. First of all, I mean, I, I would not do this method uh, with the RBDs and the flip together first. I would try the other method, which I know will be simpler to control. Um, I would do that first. And then if I really need to get floating, then I might look at doing this. Maybe just for those areas that I need to see the floating. Or potentially, you know, come up with some other method. There's, there's lots of methods that you could try that don't involve simulating as well. And that you know, maybe something that you could consider. Um, you can see they're still still kind of sinking, but if you go and have a look underneath, they may they may hit a point where they start rising back up. It doesn't look like it. Not yet, at least. And possibly once they're outside of the um, outside of this area, they're just going to fall anyway. And that's where I would probably set a limit to my pops so that only my gravity affects things that are above the plane and not so far below. Like maybe I set the gravity, I'll use a pop force to just set things to only apply negative up to a certain point. And then below here, there's no gravity and they just will rise with that buoyancy. There's all sorts of things fighting against you to sort of achieve these effects. So you have to work out these kind of custom ways of, uh, you know, of dialing them in. I don't know why the hell these pieces are just floating off into space though. It's kind of weird. I think it's just this super strong velocity that's coming from my ship. Anyway, there you go. I'm out of time. Thank you for joining me again, everybody. I hope, uh, I hope that was helpful for you, um, Renee. And yeah, next week we'll look at doing some explosions. I don't know what it's going to be exactly, but I'm going to try and come up with something fun. Um, and we'll probably stick with that for a couple of weeks. And uh, yeah, keep uh, keep the ideas coming. If you have any ideas for stuff, please uh, please let me know. Thanks for joining me, Audrey, Adam. Good to see you guys. Um, thanks, you too. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll keep working on the rising spaceship as well, just fixing some of those errors and re-rendering that flip and we'll see if that fixed it. Um, yeah, look, just keep uh, crab exploding. That sounds fun, Audrey. Um, yeah, just, just keep testing, Ronin. There's, there's lots of, you know, there's lots of ways to approach things, but uh, certainly RBDs and flip together is, is going to be challenging. So, yeah. But hopefully I've given you some some ideas anyway. Um, cool. All right, guys. Well, uh, yeah. Thanks again for joining me. No worries. Yeah. I'm, well, I'm glad they're helpful. Thank you, Renee. Means a lot. And uh, yeah, I'll see you guys. See you guys next week. Have a good week, everybody. Happy Houdiniing. <laughs>